just welcome everybody as always. We're running a couple of minutes behind, but we, um, you know, I picked a, I picked a, a, a song this morning, and uh, and uh, George is not sure if it's the right one or not. But anyway, we're going to do it anyway. And uh, the reason I picked it is because we're talking about freedom today because it's the Fourth of July. And the song is number 354, which is I Surrender All. And through Christ, we have the freedom to surrender. And that's an important thing to recognize because we don't always have the freedom to surrender to something. But we have the freedom to surrender to Him because He gives us that he said he came to fulfill the law not to do away with it he came to fulfill the law and by fulfilling it we surrender to him I don't know if that makes a lot of sense but it's it's a concept we talk about people having the will to make choices and all of that and that's where we derive the strength to make the choices is from him and the freedom to make those choices. So, when we surrender to him, we do. <laughs> Let's do number 354. The first, second, and fourth first. Not the fifth, not the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph and, and 
all of that. But now we're kind of kind of shifting gears a little bit, and, and again talking about our relationship with our neighbor, and who is our neighbor, and all of that. And today's lesson is 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 from the book from the book of Proverbs. It's just selected passages from the book of Proverbs dealing with our relationship with our neighbor and with other people. And, you know, our neighbor does all, doesn't always come in the form of somebody that lives next door to us. It can come in the form of somebody on the other side of the world. But uh, it also does come in the form of the person who lives next door to us. And I hope you had a chance to read the lesson from the from the, the student book because that's one of the things that this lady is addressing is, is the relationship between living beside somebody and living next door to somebody. One of the things that I want us to do this morning, I hope, hope you will, is, um, you know, I kind of jotted down some questions that are associated with it with the scripture that we're going to be reading. And I want your thoughts on it. Please, please say what uh, say what you think. Because I'm going to, after we do some of the some of the scripture, I'm going to ask you for your thoughts. I'm going to ask you to make comments. Give you an opportunity to make comments. And I hope you'll you'll share what's on your mind. Again, there are multiple pieces to this this morning multiple pieces to the to the scripture that's been chosen but all is from the book of proverbs and the first reading is from the third chapter and it's verses uh verses 27 through 30 third chapter of proverbs verses 27 through 30 i'm going to read those through do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to act do not say to your neighbor, come back later, I'll give it tomorrow when you now have it with you. Do not plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. Do not accuse a man for no reason when he has done you no harm. Again, first one. Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to act. Do not hold good from those who deserve it. Does that give us license to determine who deserves it and who doesn't? No. Why? Because only God can do that. Amen. So why is he why is he telling us? Why is he telling us to not withhold good from those who deserve it? Why would he be telling us to consider who deserves it? Sometimes you say, if I give him four dollars he's going straight to the liquor store and he's going to be on my porch acting crazy in about an hour or two that's my reason for not giving him the four dollars he asked for even though he might have a sick child and might need a bowl of soup for the child it might not be to buy the liquor but that's a that's a tough decision to make sometimes when you got that kind of neighbor that does tend to get drunk or get high and misbehave. And what it says you is might have the four dollars, but you might think it would be a wrong investment to give it to him. And the second part of that says when it's in your power to act, and which would mean that you have the four dollars. But one of the things that he says is don't withhold good from those who deserve it. You know, we, uh, we, to Irby's point, it's 
not up to us to say whether this is a good person or a bad person or whatever. That's not that's not what we're called to do. That's not we're not called to make judgment about the person and their relationship to God. But we can make determination about their relationship in the world and to us. Because remember that we're talking about our neighbor. We're talking about how, it, again, the purpose, the purpose of the lesson is to acknowledge the risk in loving our neighbor. Because there is a risk in loving our neighbor. There's a risk in, in how we have that relationship. So what we're talking about here is as far as deserving it, we're not supposed to determine it from God's viewpoint. <clears throat> we're not empowered to do that. But Scripture also tells us that we're supposed to work, that we're supposed to do something, that we are supposed to apply our faith. Faith of our works is dead. That's what we hear all the time. So we are charged with making sure that the love we have for our neighbor is expressed in a way that is beneficial and positive and not just sugarcoating, if you will. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's like it's a good thing we didn't give money baggage out to Boy Scout countenances. <laughs> I got you. Uh, the next one says, do not say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow, I'll give it come back later, I'll give it you tomorrow when you now have it with you. If you'll remember in the book of James it says talks about the person that says to somebody that needs a coat that's cold needs food and the person says to them, well go and be warm and well fed but no, does nothing to do that then they haven't done anything they haven't met with their faith so are we charged with doing something about it Are we charged with are we charged with helping all these missions? Are we help, are we charged with helping at James Crossing? Are we charged with helping with Parkview? Yeah. Absolutely we are. Absolutely we are. Could we so, say a prayer asking God to help the individual be responsible with what we're willing to give to them instead of just saying well I'm not going to give it to you because I think you're going to misbehave or I'm not going to give it to you until tomorrow but give it to them and trust that God can help them to be responsible with it I think we have to we have to ask him for I think we have to invoke him through prayer to see that the right thing is done with it we have to invoke him with prayer for us to make the decision about the right thing to be done with it. You know, that term, the right thing, is a, is a challenging one. Because again, what's, what's right in my eyes may be different in yours or vice versa. And what's right for this situation may not be right for another. You know, there are people that you can hand four dollars to and they'll do the right thing with. It. There are people you can hand four dollars to and they'll go to the liquor store. You yes. have the song yes. I surrender. And it keeps hitting me that in marriage sometimes we fall short 
because of what happened yesterday or what happened last week. We don't want to cooperate with our mate because we're holding a grudge against them or we're not trusting them. But the song says, I surrender all, trusting God, trusting that God will do what's right and God will help our mate to not disappoint us or help our mate not to misuse our systems. Herbert? Well, like he said, about $4. Maybe you hedge your bets a little bit. Give them $2. Tell you it doesn't do with that. You give them two more. Okay. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. It's, and I think, too, when people say, like a man is often at Kroger, oh, my car's broken down. Could you give me a little money to call the rapper? And so I just said, I will call the rapper for you and pay for it. And that's not what he really wants. No, and he walks yeah. off. No, that's right. That's right. right. That's right. And, and, and we've seen it. We've, we've all encountered that. We've all encountered that. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's still, that's still helping a fellow human being if they need help. You know, and that's where this deserving part comes in. If they are doing the right thing themselves, if they are following what God intends for them to do, then they'll let you call the record. You know, they'll let you, they'll let you call the record and use and use your resources for that. The Good Samaritan made an investment and didn't know that it was going to get a return from that investment. He might have never seen that guy again. The, the, the innkeeper might have said, well, this guy took all this stuff from us and said that you're going to be responsible for it, you know. Uh, but the Good Samaritan gave his assistance and gave his money and gave his medicine, and he didn't have a guarantee that that was going to all turn out to be good. And his time, he gave his time as well to take the to the end. And a lot of that was just trusting God. But didn't he also didn't he also take a step? It wasn't his intention to reflect Christ. But isn't that what he was doing, whether he intended to or not, that he was reflecting what Christ teaches. He was reflecting Jesus in in, in his actions. Because not only did he bring the person there and, and care for them on the way, but he, he left a certain amount of, of money to take care of the person when he left. And he said, when I come back, if that wasn't enough, I'll make up the difference. But he left some money there to take care of him to start So, again, it's a reflection what we're charged with is to be disciples. And we're supposed to be reflections. Some of us don't do a very good job of that reflection, but we're charged with doing that. The next one says that we uh, we don't plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully beside you. Trustfully near you. You know, we we put a lot of trust in the person who's beside us. And when I say beside us, that's whether it's somebody next door to your house or somebody coming down the road in a car. We, we put a lot of trust in those people. We, you know, when, we, when we're riding the road, and, you know, most, many times, how many times during the day are we three feet away from a 110 mile an hour crash? You know, I mean, we put a lot of trust in somebody that uh, that they're going to drive correctly, and we put a lot of faith in in the Lord that they're not going to have a heart attack, something that they don't have any control over, that they're still going to run into us head on. So it's saying. Don't harm your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. 
That person has trust in you. So you shouldn't do anything to them. Now, which comes first, the chicken or the egg? Who's supposed to who's supposed to make the first move, as they say? To be a good neighbor, to work amicably towards a relationship. Who's supposed to make that first move? That's not telling us what the answer to that is. That's not telling us who that is, who's supposed to make that first move. It's simply telling us not to plot against the name. That's all right. Me and Lai, I pray he has had been a country mile around me. That's right. That's right. I see that the last one got in front of the preacher. And it looks like Jesus is, is comforting somebody in need. And that's an example for me to want to comfort somebody in need. Uh, but I don't always feel that way. I, so, sometimes I feel that I got a bad deal and I need to look at it differently. And that's not what Jesus was doing. He, he, he was comforting that guy. And he, he, he wasn't saying, you know, that he knew that guy's history. And he, he, he wasn't saying that the guy that made him a promise, he's just comforting him. He, he's been God the Father to us and given us the love we we need. And he's not asking for a list of what we're going to promise to do and, and, and uh, how, how we're going to guarantee that everything's going to turn out right. He, 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 he says, forgive them for they know not what they do. And we didn't really deserve his forgiveness, but but he he gave it before we even asked for it. He, we're we're deserving of his justice. We're deserving of his wrath. But he didn't give it to us. He gave us his 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 salvation. He gave us his forgiveness. And you know we are deserving of entirely the opposite. But yet that's what he gave to us. So again, what we're told is to try to reflect him, to try to act like, like he does. Let's move on to the next group of verses. Uh, again, we're, uh, we're still in Proverbs, and we move over to the sixth chapter, and it's the first, uh, the first five verses. It says, My son, if you, have, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have struck hands in pledge for another, if you have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth, then do this, my son, to free yourself, since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go and humble yourself. Press your plea with your neighbor. Allow no sleep to come to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowl. So he's talking about somebody that has entered into some agreement with a person. Made a contract by, by, by handshake, of course, in those days something that we used to do, but don't do much of it anymore. But made a contract by handshake, pledged security for something. Could have been what we would call today a co-signer on a loan, or somebody who pledged collateral for a, for a loan or for some other uh, endeavor. And then he also talks about, again, he means whoever the writer is, a little aside, you know, we, we give Solomon credit for writing much of Proverbs, and apparently that is true, but there were others who wrote Proverbs, who, who wrote the Proverbs that we see in this book. So this is not all Solomon, but certainly he's credited, and presumably accurately so, 
with much of what's, what we see here. But the writer is giving a couple of examples, putting up security for something, making a pledge. They, he calls it, he calls it have struck hands and pledge. Or you have said something that you shouldn't have said. You have, he, he uses the term, you have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. And then he says, do this to free yourself. So it's as though what he's saying is wrong. Is it wrong for us to enter into a contract with somebody? It'd be a little tough to get through this world if we didn't contract with some folks on some things. So does that is that guiding us to the adage of neither a borrower or a lender be. That's scripture. That scripture says that. So, is it like a lot of things that we are to apply them? We can we can take different paths. And we can do different things, but aren't we called to do it under his guidance? Isn't that the difference? That we don't put ourselves in a position that we make an enemy by helping somebody out. Nor do we do it just for our own benefit to help somebody out but that we have an eye on the correct reason that we do what we do comments does that make the any sense the guy owes the king a bunch of money and he cried on the king for mercy and the king wiped off his responsibility and free him and as he left the king he saw a fella that owed him some money and he just got all out of sorts and said this guy has been owing me for a year and promised he was going to pay me back and I need that money now and, and he don't never do what he said he going to do and he's forgotten all about the king had wiped off his debt and he called for the guy that owed him to be put in prison but it was wrong that he didn't remember the mercy of the king regarding his debt it's a tremendous and, analogy it really is i mean that's, ex that's exactly what we're talking about you know my goodness, that's that's the perfect example of do under others. You know, we uh, some things are very simplistic, but their application becomes very complex because again, we we can take very simple. It's it's easy to take scripture and just take a piece of it, take a verse. Take a sentence, take a section, and just twist it around to suit yourself, to suit whatever application, whatever you want to say with it. You can twist it around to do something else with it. But we're called upon to use what he tells us in its entirety, not just the pieces of it. We're called upon to, to, to use what he says to us in its entirety to govern our interactions with people. So, if we, if we do like this fellow did, 
and we get forgiven, I mean, we got forgiven our debts on the cross. And if we fail to forgive our debts, the debts of others to us, now, that doesn't mean that we have the obligation to give up our monetary debts. That's not what that means. Because, again, there are other things that come into play. You know, we are not supposed to, we're not supposed to renege on what we do. We're not supposed to renege on our work, on our contract, on our vow. We're not supposed to renege on that. So, just because we were forgiven, it still means that we are supposed to forgive, but we're supposed to forgive based on what God teaches us and not our dealings with the world. Does that make sense? As a Christian that's growing, that seeks to be more like Jesus, I should want to be a little bit more mature than I was last year and I should be able to say forgive them for they know not what they do realizing that that would make me be more like Jesus's character which is what I'm trying to be more like and it might be hard but it should be easier this year than it was a year before because I understand that that's what Jesus would want me to do. And he, he, would, he would want me to be a good neighbor. And he, 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 he would want me not to go back on what happened two years ago and uh, call in the jail and put somebody in prison. He would want me to be more like him. The 20th and the 21st verses of uh, the 14th chapter, they say to us, the poor are shunned even by their neighbors, but the rich have many friends. He who despises his neighbor sins, but blessed is he who is kind to the needy. Remember, remember this whole series is respond. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about this whole series. And this particular purpose is, is our interaction with our neighbors. To acknowledge the risk <coughs> of loving our neighbors. And when we look at this, when we look at this verse we just read, the poor are shunned even by their neighbors. You know, if somebody doesn't have a lot, they tend to be outcast. They tend, we tend not to care much about them. The rich have many friends. Is that because we have the best friends that money can buy. A lot of times that's true. You know, we've always we've always heard the adage that if you have, if you can count five true friends on your hand, on one hand you have you have great wealth. Because again, we all know people who are successful and, you know when you see them you see a lot of folks because folks want to be around successful people and there's nothing wrong with that you know we, we we do enjoy success and success means a lot of different things it doesn't always just mean just just financial wealth but success can mean relationships you know, you, 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 have a, you have a family that, that has a good relationship, and people want to be around that family. They enjoy being around that family. 
that family enjoys being around each other. So, rich does not always mean wealthy, but it does mean that you have, it does not mean that you have financial wealth, but it can mean that you have wealth in many other ways as well. And A wealth of knowledge can help you quite a bit. It certainly can. And that's and that's you know, people that are that's part of leadership. That's part of, of being a leader. I uh, heard heard a man say one time, and I'm probably paraphrasing what he said, but you know, when people stop coming to you for advice with their thoughts, their problems, their questions then maybe you have lost some of your ability as a leader. And, you know, it gets to be challenging sometimes when people are loading you up with questions and loading you up with, with responsibilities. But that's also a positive because they have confidence in you. They believe in what you can do or what you will do and what you'll, what the role that you will take. They believe in you. So therefore, they turn to you. Maybe they'll load your plate up, but at least they have confidence in you. I'm going to move on to the, to the last group. and uh, It's the 25th chapter, and it's verses 20 through 21. 25th chapter, verses 20 through 21. Like one who takes away a garment on a cold day, or like vinegar poured on soda, is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. As a north wind brings rain, so a sly tongue brings angry looks. These little proverbs are just, you know, are just something to behold, to, to read through them and, and see what they have to say to us. Like one who takes away a garment on a cold day or like vinegar poured on a soda is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. Somebody has a heavy heart there dealing with a bad situation. They're dealing with the law. Maybe. We should sing songs of praise to God. But we're not singing songs to them. We're not singing songs to them to lighten their mourning, their challenge, their suffering. If we sing songs, they should be songs that lift up God and songs that help them to meet the challenge that they are facing. hope that makes sense. Because that's, that's a little bit of an interesting uh, verse that we see. The metaphor of the metaphor of Heaping coals on there. I think that's so interesting. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. You don't do it because the Lord will reward you. And the heaping coals on him. The point is, the heaping coals on his head is not to harm him and not to humble him before you, but to humble him before the Lord. In other words, if that person understands the context in which you are giving him food to eat and water to drink, 
if that person understands the context in which you are doing it because your God has said you need to love your neighbor so therefore I'm giving you even though you're my enemy I'm going to give you this food to eat I'm going to bring you this water I'm going to share this with you because my God says that's what I'm supposed to do. Not because I believe you did the right thing. Not because you are coming to attack me. Not because you're going to come to war with me. Not because you're going to break in my house. Not because you're going to do something against me. I'm not doing that because I like it. But I'm doing it because that's what my God says I'm supposed to do. And I serve him first. I'll serve you second because I serve him first. Make sense? Nothing wrong with giving something for a little attitude adjustment. That's true. <laughs> attitude adjustment. That's good. That's good. Okay, well our time is, is about gone. That's right. And nothing and nothing teaches us how to become mature than as much as trying to figure out how to love our neighbor and fulfill that part of the scripture to love our neighbors and ourselves and love love the Lord our God of course with all our heart and to love our neighbors ourselves. Our closing prayer. Our, bread. our closing prayer says, Lord, may we take the risk we need to take to love the people we have called, you have called us to love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank y'all. Thank you. Thank you.